In this video, we're going to take it. Uh, we're going to take a look at the different types of estates in land. You know, there's different ways you can own land, own property. And we're going to look at, there, there's a couple different types that, we're, um, that you need to be aware of. You need to understand it, obviously, for exam purposes. There's what we call a freehold estate, which is what basically just means an ownership estate. That means you own it. It's yours. But then there's also the, what we call the non-freehold estate, or sometimes you could hear it referred to as a leasehold estate. And that's pretty much exactly what it sounds like. That means you are a tenant. You're leasing property. Well, if you sign a lease or have a lease for property, then as the tenant, you own a non-freehold estate, which is not an ownership, but yet you still own interest in the property. Now, this video, we're only going to talk about the types of freehold estates. Uh, we'll do another video on the non-freehold. <clears throat> but we just want to focus on really two types of freehold estates that we want to um, pay attention to. Now, before we even get into the freehold estates, you see there's two, actually three terms that you need to know the definitions of. You need to be familiar with these three terms because it will help you when we go through these estates. Um, obviously, it's a big part of it. But, you know, the first one is tenancy. Now, this word tenancy actually has two completely different definitions depending on the type of estate you're referring to. So you want to pay attention to this. Um, remember just a second ago, we said there's two types. You could own a freehold estate or there could be the non-freehold or leasehold estate. And depending on which type you're referring to, the term tenancy actually means something different. But if you're referring to freehold, which is what our focus is going to be on uh, during this video, it says free, freehold tenancy just means how the land is held. In other words, is there just one owner of the property or are there multiple owners, two or more owners of the property? That's what tenancy is referring to. So how the land is held. But just real quick, if you're, if you're dealing with non-freehold, now tenancy means something different. Now it means the length of time or duration. Okay, and again, we'll talk about that again in another video. But right now we just want to focus on the two, in particular, two types of freehold estates. But then you need to know what interest means. So if you own interest in property, and you hear this term a lot, obviously, in real estate, um, if you own any interest in land, that means it comes with what we consider the full bundle of legal rights, which we're not going to get into a whole lot of detail on that bundle. But you can see what those rights consist of, the right to use, control, <clears throat> possession, disposition, quiet enjoyment. Those are the bundle of legal rights, which I will tell you be very important to know for exam purposes. You need to know what the bundle of legal rights are. Um, again, another video. I'm not going to get off into the weeds on that. Um, but by the way, and again, not that we're talking about non-freehold estates here, but I do want to just throw this out there, something to consider you know if you're a tenant you sign a lease on a property which means you now own a non-freehold interest remember and again i said you own a non-freehold interest in real estate does that mean as a tenant you now own the full bundle of legal rights again to use control possession disposition uh quiet enjoyment and I'll tell you, you do. You absolutely do. A lot of, a lot of landlords, certainly tenants, don't realize that. But landlord, when you sign that lease with a tenant, you've conveyed these rights to the tenant. They now have the right to use it, control it, possess it. Disposition. Now, what? In the first of all, if you don't know what disposition means, um, disposition is the right to dispose of that interest. Again, I'm not going to get into the weeds there and obviously quiet enjoyment. But then the last term you see there is the word fee. And I will tell you, and if you remember this, this can be very helpful to you. 
anytime you see the word fee, like fee simple, defeasible fee, you know, any type of estate that has the word fee in it. Fee just means that that estate is inheritable. You can leave it to your heirs when you die. So anytime you own anything in fee, you can leave to your heirs when you die. Um, it just means it's inheritable. Okay. So let's talk about these the, really two types of freehold estates that I want to focus on. The first one is the fee simple absolute. Now you'll notice, in fact, it says first thing here, you know, if you own anything in fee simple absolute, that is the highest degree of ownership recognized certainly in this country. That's the way I would presume most people would prefer to own land in fee simple absolute. Well, if I own it in fee simple absolute, can I leave it to my heirs when I die? Well, obviously, yes, because you see the word fee. Again, fee means it's inheritable. Simple means just that. It means it's simple or uncomplicated. What you own is simple. It's not complicated. There are, in, in fact, if I put it in these words, there are no restrictions on the use or what you can do with the property. Um, it's yours. I mean, as long as you comply with zoning and other laws, but, but there's no one else that has put any restrictions on what you can or cannot do with the property. Y'all, that's why it's considered the highest degree of ownership. That's a fee simple absolute. Now, the other type that we'll probably be spending the most time on is what we call the defeasible fee estate. Well, if I own this house, this land, this property in defeasible fee, can I leave this to my heirs when I die? Obviously you can, again, because you see the word fee. Y'all keep emphasizing that. That's going to be critical for test purposes. Fee means it's inheritable. So there you go. But you'll notice there's a word missing from the previous estate. There's a word that's not in this title, and that's simple. Y'all, defeasible fee estates are not simple a lot of times. In fact, they can be quite complicated, meaning there are restrictions that you will have to comply with. Um, Y'all, in fact, if you can just remember this, this will also help you tremendously on the exam. Anytime you see the word defeasible, the first thing that should come straight to your mind, restrictions. There are restrictions. That's what defeasible means here. I would keep that in mind. <clears throat> Please remember, I don't know why we have such a hard time remembering that, but if you see the word defeasible, the first thing you should, up oh, restrictions. We're going to be dealing with restrictions here. And that's the, that would be the case here. So, so when we talk about restrictions, where does the restriction come from? Or who puts it there? Who put that restriction <clears throat> on this property? Well, it's going to be whoever you received it from, whether, they, whether it was given to you or whether you purchased it, but whoever conveyed the property to you, they agreed to convey it to you, but with restrictions on, and, and now look, these restrictions can be absolutely anything. As long as it's legal, obviously, you, know, you cannot have an illegal restriction. Um, but you see all kinds of stuff here. Um, you know, for example, I might put, I might, I might give this property to my son. Say, look, son, you can have it as long as you never allow alcohol on this land. Now, look, you may not like that. If you were my son, you may not like the fact that I put that restriction there, but it's a legal restriction. You know, for obviously I don't want alcohol on this land. Now you might say, well, then you can keep your land, you know, but obviously that's up to you. But if you agree to accept the land, then you must agree to whatever the restriction is. Because if you violate that restriction, you know, in this case, if you allow alcohol on this land, 
you've lost the property. It's gone. Y'all, and it's immediate. Bam. I mean, it's, as soon as you violate it, it's gone. You, now, you no longer own the property. So the question now becomes, well, what happened to it? What happens to the land? Where did it go? Who gets it? You know, and that we're going to talk about. But I want to go and talk a little bit more about these restrictions. I'm telling you, this is a very common estate. A lot of people own property, but it comes with restrictions. Now, does if there's a restriction there, and then... Let y'all say in this case, my son decided to sell the property to somebody else. Does the restriction still apply to the next property owner? And the answer is absolutely. Absolutely it does. Because y'all, that's a restriction that I put in the deed. Right? When I deeded it to you, there was a restriction in it. And y'all, in anything, any restrictions that are in the deed will convey from one owner to the next. So don't, you don't want it. So don't think just because now that I'm buying it, nobody told me about any restrictions. So I, that doesn't apply to me. Oh yes, it does. Y'all, and this is the reason I'm harping on this a little bit. Cause y'all in the real world, when you get out there practicing real estate, Y'all, especially if you're representing the buyer, y'all, you need to get a copy of the deed. Y'all, it shouldn't be that hard. I know certainly around here, and I'm sure probably most places in the country, y'all, you can get this information online today. Y'all, you just go on the um, county website, whatever county you live in, and you can usually pull the deed up. Y'all, you can usually online. Well, in the deed, if there are restrictions, it will state it. You'll see the restriction there. Um, Y'all, I've seen all kinds of restrictions. Y'all, I've actually seen restrictions about no alcohol. I've seen restrictions say at no time will there ever be any farm animals allowed on this property. Um, I've actually seen where people were named in the deed basically saying, and just, I'll use this example. Say I've got a daughter and she's looking or wanting a place to stay. And I've got this property that I, maybe I usually rent it out, but I'm going to let my daughter have it. So she'll have somewhere to live. But I also know she's been seeing somebody or wanting to see somebody that I don't want her to see for whatever reason. So I put in the deed. This is yours as long as John Doe or whoever it is, is not allowed on this property, can never come on to this property. Y'all, I can put that in the deed. I can limit access to certain people, um, apparently, because I've seen it. Um, so, y'all, look, so there could be all kind of restrictions and, and some of them are kind of weird, quite frankly. But I know if I were the one buying this property and restrictions exist with the property, I would want to know that. And I would expect my agent to make me aware of that. That's for sure. All right. So just keep, so just, a, just a review real quick. If it's a defeasible fee estate, defeasible means there are restrictions and that those restrictions will apply and bind successive owners of the property because y'all once it's in the deed it stays there um and i've had people say well can you ever take it out of the deed well the person that put it in the deed could take it out of the deed but that's the only person that can do it um now a lot of times what you'll see well, well oftentimes you will see there might be a restriction y'all for example i might have put in there you know john doe's not allowed on this property but I might also add to it that this restriction will be lifted once my daughter graduates from college you know, or something like that. Maybe I put some objective or goal there. And once that objective or goal has been met or accomplished, then the restriction will automatically terminate. You know, you can put stuff like that as well in the deed. But y'all, hopefully what you're seeing right now is, what is so important to get a copy of the deed and read it. Y'all, I'm telling you, 
Now, first of all, should the seller and or listing agent have disclosed that these restrictions exist, if there are any? Absolutely. But I will tell you, they don't a lot of times. And, it's not, and a lot of times, it's not because they were trying to hide it. It's just probably they didn't, didn't even think about it or d don't even remember it being there. Um, but that doesn't change the fact that you could have an issue. If, you know, for example, is it possible you could violate the restriction because you didn't even know the restriction was there? It could happen, potentially. And guess what? If you violate that restriction, whether you knew about it or not, <clears throat> you've lost ownership of this property. It's gone. So where is it gone? Well, that's what we want to talk about now. It depends on the type of defeasible fee estate that was established. Well, there's three types of defeasible fee estates. And, I'm, and I'll tell you, this will be on the, on the real estate exam. Not very comp, not too hard, but <coughs> let's take a look at them. Anyway, fee simple determinable. That's the first one. If it's a fee simple determinable, all that means is there's an automatic reversion of interest. It's automatic. Meaning the moment my son, for example, allows alcohol on the land, he violated restriction, well, the ownership automatically reverts back to me as the grantor. Automatic. Y'all, there's nothing I have to do. There's no action I have to take. It's just bam, it's gone. And it comes right back to me. Y'all, don't worry about, let's, we're not going to try to get into the weeds here. I know a lot of times when I'm in a live class, so, well, how do you know, how do you prove they did it? And then, you know, we got all these questions, and I, I get it. Y'all, we're not going there. Neither you need to be concerned about that on, on, for exam purposes. Okay, so we're not going to get bogged down in the weeds. You just need to understand what these things are. Again, if it's a fee simple determinable, you just need to know that's an automatic reversion. Automatic. Boom. Comes right back to the grand tour. Now, if we set it up as a fee simple subject to a condition subsequent, seems a little wordy, but y'all just got to be familiar with But y'all, condition subsequent just means there's no automatic reversion of interest. So when the restriction is violated, it will not automatically revert back to the grantor, meaning there's some action that I, as the grantor I would have to take, maybe some legal action or something that would be required in order for me to get the title or ownership of the property back. I hear people say, well, why would you do that? If you're going to put the restriction, why wouldn't you just leave it as an automatic reversion? Yup, not going there. Okay, for the, for the purpose of the exam and, and certainly this video, again, look, we're not estate planners, and this is what I have to try to explain in the classroom. We're real estate agents. We're not estate planners, and our job is not to really understand all the intricate details. So you don't need to worry about that. What you do need to understand is real estate. You need to be familiar, <clears throat> again, as a real estate agent, of how some of this stuff is set up and, and have some basic understanding of what it means because you're, you're likely going to be dealing with it at some point when you're practicing real estate. All right, so condition subsequent just means there's no automatic reversion. I will have to take some action to get title back. Now, I want to be clear. I can get the title back and I will get it back. So I, I don't want it to sound like I may or may not be able to get title back. Y'all, I'm getting it back. As soon as I can show that the restriction was violated, I can and will get it back. It's just I have to take some action to make it happen. Okay? So that's the only t difference between the first two. Y'all, fee simple determinable, automatic reversion. Condition subsequent, I have to file or take some action to get it back. It's the only difference between those two. Now, the last one or third one here is the fee simple with an executory interest. Now, executory interest means there's an automatic reversion of interest. It's automatic. No action has to be taken. The difference is it does not automatically come back to the grantor or the person that actually conveyed the property to you. 
Rather, it will automatically convey to some other part, some third named party. So somebody that was named in the estate, it will, it will say it in the deed that if this restriction is violated, it will automatically revert to James Smith or, or whoever. Okay. So again, the only difference here, again, it's an automatic reversion. It's just with an executory interest. That means a third party has been named to receive it once the restriction is violated. Now, let me, in fact, I'll give you a, a sample or an example of a question um, they could potentially ask you, you know, concerning these types of estates. Say you've got an, an individual donated a piece of land to a hospital. Obviously, you own land that was adjacent to a hospital. So he decided just to donate the land to the hospital with the condition that that land always be used for hospital purposes. And if it's ever used for any other purpose, ownership will automatically convey to John Doe. What type interest does the hospital own in this land? Well, hopefully you say, well, that's an executory interest because it named a third part. First of all, there was a restriction put on the land, right? The restriction was that it had to be used for hospital purposes. In other words, the hospital couldn't just sell it to some other entity and they do something else with it. You either use it for yourself for hospital purposes or it will go to John Doe. Well, because a third party was named, that's an executory interest. So obviously the answer would be fee simple with an executory interest. Y'all hopefully that helps you a little bit, but that's sort of how they're going to ask questions on the exam. So as long as you kind of know the definitions, you know, I don't think you're going to have any problems answering the questions when it comes to these types of estates. Now, look, those were the two types of estates. But now we need to spend just a few minutes, a couple minutes on the types of tenancies. Because I will tell you, they're going to ask you questions about these on the exam. This is not hard if you'll just, if you'll understand a couple different truths here. First of all, what did we say tenancy meant with freehold estates? Remember, tenancy means how the land is held. Is it held by one owner? Does just one person own the property? Or are there multiple owners, meaning two or more owners? That's what we're dealing with when we talk about tenancy and the types of tenancy. So if we look at the first one here, say tenancy and severalty. Well, severalty just means one. <clears throat> so obviously, if, if you own this property in severalty, that means you own it yourself. There are no other owners other than you. That's severalty. Y'all, that's pretty simple right there. Um, one owner. So obviously, if you own it in any other type of tenancy, what might that suggest to you before we even look at the other ones? multiple owners, at least two or more, right? Because tenants of several is one. So anything else is going to be dealing with two or more owners. <clears throat> well, the next one we look at is this tenancy in common. Well, tenancy in common obviously means two or more owners. There are multiple owners. But the main thing to remember about tenancy in common, each owner will receive their own title reflecting whatever interest they own in the property so let's for example you know let's say myself and two other partners so there's three of us together we decide to go in and buy an investment property as tenants in common well when the when the attorney does the title work that means all three of us as tenants in common will receive our own title. Now look, we could just split it up evenly, basically saying that each one of us will own one third interest because there's three of us. And if that's the case, then my title will show Frankie Griffin owns one third interest in this property. And then the other two will have their own title reflecting their one third interest. 
but it does not have to be equal amounts of interest. Y'all, this is really critical here. And when we get into talking about the next type of tenancy, you're going to see why. But y'all, you got to remember this about tenancy in common. Owners do not have to own equal shares of interest. Y'all, for example, we could have set it up where I own 50% interest in this property and the other two own 25% a piece. Again, my title, if that would be the case, that my title, say Frankie Griffin owns 50%, the other two will have their title showing that they own 25% or whatever. Y'all doesn't, doesn't even have to be equal with the other two. So y'all, it can be any amount of interest between the partners. It's just whatever the, the partners agree to. Y'all, that's critical there. You, you got you to gotta remember this about tenancy in common. Number Two things. Number one, each owner receives their own title and interest can be divided on each. Y'all, it does not have to be equal shares. It does not have to be equal shares. Y'all, you got to remember that. I'm telling you, if you don't remember that, you're going to have problems. So I hope you wrote that down. All right. I'm not going to beat that up. Now, the, the last thing we need to touch on with this type of tenancy. Y'all, again, let's say I own that one-third interest with my two partners. When I die, can I, can I leave my interest to my heirs when I die? Or does it go to the other two partners? And the answer is, yes, I can leave it to my heirs. I can leave, I can do whatever I want to do with it. Basically, y'all, could I sell my interest without my partner's permission? And I will tell you, I can. Now, look, you, in the real world, you probably want to <clears throat> work this out with your partners. They might want to buy you out or if you just want to get out of it or whatever. But at the end of the day, if they don't want to buy me out, could I just sell it to somebody else? Yes. Barring any restrictions, yes, I can. I can sell it myself. Y'all, look, the key is because I have my own title. Y'all, as long as I have my own title, I can do pretty much whatever I want to do with it, right? Y'all, that's a key element of tenancy in common. All right, now, this third type of tenancy is we call joint tenancy. Now, this is different. It's very common, but I'm telling you, it's much different than tenancy in common. And I will tell you, this is really where the problem lies when people have problems on the state exam. They confuse joint tenancy with tenancy in common and vice versa. But obviously, joint tenancy also means multiple owners, at least two or more. The big difference with joint tenancy and tenancy in common with joint tenancy, there's only going to be one title. There's only going to be one. And, and y'all, I'll just use the same example. Me and my two partners buy this investment property. But this time we decided to do it as joint tenants. Well, now there's only going to be one title. Each one of us are not going to have our own title. There's only going to be one title. It will have all three of our names listed on it. But basically, it's going to show that all three of us own the whole property. Okay? All three of us own the whole property. Y'all, there is no division of interest. Y'all remember with tenancy in common, we could divide it up unequally. Not with joint tenancy. You all three own all of it. You can't say, well, I get this amount and you get that amount. Nope. You all, basically, all three of you become one under joint tenancy. Now, when, it, when you're dealing with joint tenancy, y'all, this will involve, all, it always involves what they refer to as special wording. Y'all, in fact, I'm going to tell you right now, if you see a question on the exam, and it's talking about a, a type of tenancy or ownership that requires special wording, I can guarantee you that the answer they're going to be looking for is joint tenancy. Joint tenancy requires special wording. Now, what kind of wording are we talking about? Basically, it will say in the deed that ownership will always come with the right of survivorship. Y'all, that's critical when it comes to joint tenancy. 
because this is the only time it applies. Right of survivorship only applies with joint tenancy. For example, when I die, can I leave my interest to my heirs? No, not under joint tenancy because of the right of survivorship. Y'all, under this type of tenancy, if one owner dies, then the remaining owners now own all of it because of the right of survivorship. So you can't leave it to your heirs. You can't do stuff like that. Could I sell, you know, if I say I just don't want to be involved with this property anymore, I want to, I want to get out of it. I want to sell my interest. Could I sell my interest without my partner's permission? Not with joint tenancy. Um, you know, look, there are some things that you can do. I'm not going to get into that in, in this video. In the, again, in this video, I just want to make you aware of the different types of estates, free, um, fee simple estates, or freehold estates, rather. Um, so I'm not going to get into how that can happen. But I will tell you, if one party wants to get out of it bad enough, they could basically go in and, and what we call petition the courts. You know, you could petition the courts. Basically, you'd have to get a court order or a judgment from the court to allow you out of the partnership and how that's going to work. They call that partitioning the property. You know, again, I'm not going to get into that in, in, in this session. Um, maybe we'll do a video on that a little bit later. But for all intensive purposes and without justification, now, like I said earlier, you could go to court and try to get out of this joint uh, tenancy. But I will tell you, this is not automatic. Just because you go to court does not mean the courts are going to agree to it. It doesn't mean they will approve you to get out of it. Um, there's a lot of things that would have to be proven and a lot of variables. You know, there's a lot of things that go on there. That's why we're just not going to get into it in this particular session. Um, but the main thing I want you to remember here, you all the difference between tenancy in common and joint tenancy. With tenancy in common, remember there's an undivided, y'all, can we divide up interest unequally? Yes. With joint tenancy, can you divide up the interest unequally? No. Y'all can't do it with joint tenancy. Um, y'all, in fact, let me give you a question that I hear people talk about a lot, uh, you know, after taking the exam um, or it won't be exactly, obviously, I don't know what's on the state exam, how they word it exactly, but at least the subject matter will be there. But basically saying you had a husband and wife that owned the property as joint tenants. The husband dies, <clears throat> and in his will, he left his interest in that house to his son. <clears throat> Excuse me. He left his interest to his son. And basically the question is, what interest does the son own in the house? And I will tell you, the answer they're going to be looking for is none. Because first of all, again, if you own it as joint tenants, that always comes with the right of survivorship. I mean, we just talked about that. That any remaining order, remaining owners automatically now own the whole property. So if you're married, and one, and again, assuming you own it as joint tenants, when one spouse dies, that means the surviving spouse now owns all of it. So can the deceased spouse decide they're going to leave part or their share to anybody else? No, not as joint. You can't do that as joint tenants. You could as tenant in common, not as joint tenants because of the right of survivorship. Y'all, that's kind of a trick question that they could ask you there um, if you're not paying attention. Okay? All right. And then the last um, tenancy is what we call tenancy by the entirety. Y'all, this is pretty simple. Y'all, tenancy by the entirety works exactly like joint tenancy. Y'all, there's no difference between joint tenancy and tenancy by the entirety with the exception of one thing. 
And that is you must be husband and wife. Y'all, you have to be married to own property as tenants by the entirety. But if you own it by the entirety, y'all, it works the exact same way I just described joint tenant. Y'all, it's the exact same thing. It's just you must be husband and wife. So if you're husband and wife, it would be tenancy by the entirety. But if you're not husband and wife, then it would just be joint tenancy. But all the requirements are the exact same thing. Y'all, so I'm not going not to go through all that again. But again, it's the exact same thing as joint tenancy. Now, for those of you taking the, the <clears throat> state exam in South Carolina, we y'all, South Carolina does not recognize tenancy by the entirety. Okay? Again, you can still do joint tenancy, whether you're husband and wife or not husband and wife. You can still do joint tenancy and accomplish the exact same thing. But this type of tenancy is not recognized in South Carolina. Now, if you're in other states, other states do recognize. Now, I'm not saying all, but some states do recognize tenancy by the entirety. Um, so it shouldn't be a big deal <clears throat> as long as you just understand. The only difference between joint tenancy and tenancy by the entirety is you have to be husband and wife to be tenants by the entirety, right? So you know, hopefully that wasn't too difficult. I think it, um, I don't think it's too hard, but it's just some very simple things you need to remember Again, it's not hard. It's just things you have to remember for the exam. And I hope, I hope that was helpful to you. And I um, hope you do well on the exam. Thank you for watching. Have a blessed day.